back on today's show, part 11 of the Trumpeter 135th scale hind video build. Uh, we've been working through the paint section on that one. Primers, we're going to be looking at the different types of primers that I use and why I use them. Live show update, uh, we had another live show this week for a couple of hours so we'll be talking about that and what's coming up on the uh, week of live shows next week. Reviews, we've got the Kinetic 148C Harrier FA2, brand new from them. And also we've got Tamiya's 135th scale Mark IV British tank, this is the motorised version with the 135th scale figure set. We've also got the prize draw from last month's winner and all the news and gossip from the forum. Hello, welcome to Flory Models. I'm Philip Flory. Good week this week. Uh, we've done loads of different bits and pieces. Start off with, we've worked on the hind, um, which we're almost done now. A couple more bits to go on to this one. Could it a mask, flat coat, final weathering, things like that to go on with this one, and then all the little bits and pieces and aerials. So I reckon the next couple of days this will be finished off lots of fun with this one um, we cover some new stuff on this you really want to see this part if you haven't seen any of the other parts watch this one because on here I cover about removing carrier film um, from decals um, I had John over here this week uh, John Wilkes uh, was with me on Wednesday and we were talking about it and I gave it a go and it absolutely worked a tree so actually what we do is um, we remove the carrier film from the decal once it's on so that way you don't get any silver Ring, and it gives you that painted on look and then you can do whether the deco as well chip it scrape it fade it at that stage um, it's quite a complicated technique the process is straightforward but getting the hang of it is a little bit of complicated so I show it in depth on this build. So if you want to eliminate your silvering forevermore, watch this, because it's my brand new technique that I'm going to be using on every single build I do now, because quite frankly, it just, it saves all that hassle. Uh, and it gives you a more painted on look. So if you ever get trouble with silvering and all things like that, or shininess, this just eliminates all of that in one. So quite good. Also, we cover obviously the wash going on, the new style of wash and everything else. So really, that's definitely not one to be missed. Uh, what I might do at a later date is I'll do the process as a standalone as well. I show it pretty much in depth so I might just cut that section out and put it into the tips area on the main site but certainly if you ever have trouble with silvering and stuff like that then watch part 11 of the hind bill because it covers it. It's about a 15 minute section just on that but it's well worth having a look at. Generally going through with the weathering and everything else, uh, there's a few more bits and pieces I'm gonna play with and show you in the next probably two or three more parts to this one. But certainly from my point of view, it's coming to an end and I have loved that build. It's been a lot of fun start to finish. There's not been a part of that I haven't enjoyed and it has been great laugh. Also this week, um, you guys on Wednesday night joined me. I recorded um, the doing the weathering process on that uh, live. So I streamed it live as I was recording it as well, which obviously been edited into part 11 now. And then afterwards, we had about a two hour hangout um, where you guys asked me questions and some great questions came up, which I've covered in today's show. We'll be talking about primers um, and everything else. So that was great to have you there. I know a lot of you have said that it's, you know, can I give more notice? The trouble is it's, really hard for me to know when I'm going to be sat here and going to have that on as well because normally I'm recording this stuff the other stuff the reviews the bits and pieces all throughout the day and everything else so to do it at night when you guys are mostly going to be around is a little bit tricky so it's just a case of like I'm thinking well look I'll tell you what tonight I can do that bit I can settle down for a couple of hours with you and we'll do for it if I'm, you know to be honest if my partner's not here if she's off working that night then we'll have no problem at all so it's just a case of I don't know until I'm really there but as I said, keep an eye out, subscribe to the thread, uh, just the lead thread um, in the live video broadcast, and I will post up, and normally I post up and say, in an hour I'm gonna start, so if you wanna join me or anything else. The big news is next week, you're gonna get me every single night, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start my uh, post-apocalyptic mayhem vehicle build, and I'm gonna do it live every night next week. Okay, so what's going to happen is I'm going to start streaming probably around about seven to nine o'clock, maybe go even longer. When I start to run out of time, I'll go longer. Uh, but I'm going to build it live um, and live stream it. Okay, so I'll, I'll record it 
and live stream it. So if you want to watch me as I'm going through and you can ask me questions, it's going to be quite informal. So I'll get the beers out again and all the rest of it and we can just work our way through. So I can work on the other bits during the day then at night solely I'll work on the Hilux. And I've got some great things because I'm going to use a lot of weaponry from the hind and some other bits. I'm going to put them on a Hilux and turn it into a gun truck. Very futuristic looking thing and everything else. And I'm going to completely wing it as well. So what you see is what you get. I'm going to sit, literally sit here, open the box and we're going to go for it. So that's going to be all next week. So obviously it's British summertime we're currently on at the moment. So um, it's probably going to be, as I said, seven, half past seven, and I'll run it maybe nine, 10 o'clock at night. But we're going to do it every single night next week. So if you don't not around and you haven't seen it, don't panic because obviously you can watch the recording of it. What I'll do is I'm going to do a loose edit to put it together. And then that way you guys then can see it uh, in high def and all the rest of it, which is better than obviously what the uh, webcam can produce. So don't panic about not seeing the details because you can see them obviously at a later date. Or if you wanted to, you could just watch it at a later date anyway and go through. But that's the exciting news for next week. So it's going to be a live broadcast every single night next week. The idea is between fr uh, Monday to Friday, I'll get it finished. So that means it's built, you know, obviously painted, weathered and everything else all within the week. So we'll have it done in one week. So the idea is technically it's going to be a 10 hour build. That's how I'm thinking it in my head. And then we can just generally chat and waffle on like we usually do after that. It's going to be live in the forum, streamed into the forum. It's also going to be live stream onto the site as well. Um, Non-members, you're not going to be able to see it until the proper forum version comes up because obviously it's Q&As and things like that and some of it has to be edited out um, for the members things and stuff like that. So, But generally everybody else will be able to see it at some point. So that's the exciting news for next week. Can't really wait for that one. As I say, I've got all these cameras around here and I'll just, it's quite nice with the webcam because I just have the one cam and that's it. So that's really handy. So that's the exciting one for next week. Right, first up, we when we were talking in the live thing on Wednesday night, uh, primers came up and the use of primers and why I use basically four different types of primers. Let's have a look. Okay, primers. Um, why do I use so many different ones? It came up as a question in the live chat this week. Uh, and somebody said to me about, I use different primers for different things, why? Uh, when technically, you know, surely you pick one good one and, and away you go with it. There is, from my point of view, probably four different types of primer I use. Uh, to be honest, as we all know, and I've got it here, um, the this is the Revel Tornado, which I'm working on at the moment. For this one, I have used Tamiya Normal Acrylic Paint. Okay, it's just, this is XF82. I've got lots of it, so I just put it down. Um, the force for it is, it dries very, very quickly. It gives you a nice, smooth, flat finish, as you imagine, as it comes out with, and it's readily available. You know, literally just knock some up, 50-50 mix, spray it down, and away you go. The other thing that's good for it as well, you can sand it pretty much straight away as soon as it's dry. So within 10, 15 minutes, you can sand it back, see your problem areas, fix them, overcoat it, no problem at all, okay? Drawback to it is, it's quite an expensive way of doing it, okay? And from a primer's point of view, if you're using it for a little bit of gap filling capability, it's not very good, okay? So if you've got small little blemishes, it won't take those out. It'll tend to just show you what you've got, okay? and it's quite a flat finish. So if you're doing things like um, metallics, especially, you're gonna need more of a gloss finish to put them down. The other one I use is uh, Mr. Surfacer. Now, you can buy this as an aerosol can and just spray it, okay? Uh, which basically is the same stuff as the Tamiya uh, Surface Primer comes in an aerosol, okay? This is the 1200 you can see here. Uh, you have to thin it with a cellulose thinner, okay, not an enamel thinner, all right, and then that will give you a very nice, very smooth uh, finish. Again, it dries almost instantly, so it's sandable in around about sort of 10, 15 minutes, no problem at all. The other thing that's good with it as well, it's got a slightly better gap filling and leveling capability than using a normal acrylic paint. So it does have a better surface uh, to it, hence its name Surfacer. Now this does come in different flavors. Uh, you can have it, I've got them around somewhere. You can have the 500, the 1000, this is the 1200, all right? 
only spray the 1200 if you do it with the others they are thicker they will cobweb okay and if you don't get the thinning right on it it can make a real mess okay so the 1200 50 50 mix and away you go um, we'll show you that in a moment the other one um, is this guy now this is um, what's causing a little bit of the confusion this is the uh, Vallejo uh, surface primer now the great thing with this and it's a real plus for it it has a fantastic self-leveling capability you can put it on really thick okay and it literally just dries level and all your riveting detail pops back your panel line detail all those little fine things that sometimes you lose with the other two if you flood them okay this won't it comes back so it's really lovely but and there's always a but with these things and the downside is this thing takes forever to dry literally my case in here i would leave it a week now, I did the hind with it. Okay, so the hind, actually, if you remember this far back, had a complete primer coat with this stuff, purely because I knew I wouldn't be able to get around to painting it for at least three or four days. So from that point of view, it will dry back and go absolutely fine. I've used it on other big builds as well, where I know I'm not gonna come and need to touch it for a good few days. And that's the, the great thing with this stuff. If it's just chucking it on, it loves it. Okay, if you want to put it on and work on it that afternoon, you don't want to use this stuff because when you come to sand it or maneuver it in any way, it will just roll up, it peels. Okay, so because it's literally like a latex. So you put it down there, you go to sand it, it rolls up, it makes a mess. It's almost impossible then to overcoat it without having a step between the lines because you've actually torn it back to the plastic. But you give this thing a good amount of time, it will dry back, and then obviously you can just sand it as normal, but it's gonna take a minimum of three days in my temperature, maybe quicker or longer wherever you are in the world with humidity and things like that. But certainly in here, I'm basically calling it a week. Your other option, okay which is the old-fashioned way and probably the cheapest is to go out and get something like this this is just an automotive plastic gray pl uh, primer this stuff is great the only thing is it's extremely messy because it comes out at a higher rate than your airbrush can ever do okay because it's designed to do things this wide by this wide and you can literally just spray it down and it will cover everything for instance never use it with your filters okay for your actual in your spray booth because you will fill a filter instantly and wreck it so your 10 quid filter has had it in one pass with this stuff take it outside spray it outside okay and then you're good to go bonuses for it obviously it dries extremely quick uh, it probably is on a par with the Mr. Surfacer because it's got a good capability and a nice surface finish to it and everything else. The other thing as well, a can like this, to be honest, I get it from a cheap store down the road uh, and it probably, I don't know, I think I paid around about £2.50 for this and as I say, I don't know what, how much is actually in here, but it's a lot. And a couple of cans these, this is 400ml can, lasts me a long time. You can get the bigger ones and away you go. And obviously being automotive ones, you can get it in different colours, so you can get the red one, so if you're doing things like armor you might want to start with a red base coat i always tend to use grays uh, but if you wanted to if you're doing other things you can use white and so forth and so on and really that is it that's the ones i use now i know there's more out there and everything else and lots of manufacturers do their own version and everything else but that's what i do and the reasons why i do it so what i do is i'll just show you a couple of little techniques because they've all got little things to do so down here i have a bit of plastic card so this is neat white plastic card. And then what we're gonna do is just gonna do a quick, simple test on here to show going down. So, obviously I'm not gonna spray this one in here because it needs to be done outside, but trust me, we all know how to do it. It's the old fashioned, just spray it down, keep it even, and just build it up lightly. Don't flood coats, because otherwise you're gonna get tide marks in it and perhaps even bars, okay? So we all really know how to use an aerosol. So basically, uh, if we start with the Tamiya stuff, all right? As I said, the great thing about it is we've all got shelf walls of it. You don't have to use gray. I've primed things in green before. I've done it in brown and everything else. It's just a primer, it's no problem. The reason for using gray, it's a neutral color. So when you put a color over the top, um, you're not having a hard time covering it. Like you wouldn't want to go over a black primer if you were using a light gray color on top because it's going to take you forever to fill that in, especially things like white, okay? I tend to use gray because it's just a neutral color. But as I said, you could literally use anything. You could use white if you wanted to. So, from my point of view, 
obviously everybody has their own choice in thinners. My preferred one at the moment is just the Vallejo stuff. I find it works really, really well. So all we do in here, I've got a slightly dirty color cup. We're just gonna pop in here a 50-50 mix. Okay. That's probably a little bit wetter than 50-50. So what we do, we just give it a mix up in your color cup. Make sure you mix it thoroughly. Okay, and you're looking for it to cover the bristles on your end of your brush. Okay, it's the old, if you've been watching my videos recently, I've been showing you about looking at your mixture from using a brush. Just two things, remember, don't have a brush that's falling apart, because if you get a hair and it jams against the side of your nozzle and your needle, you have all types of problems. So just make sure you've got a really good one that's not gonna fall apart. But basically you put it in and you want it to sort of lump off the end and you can't see the bristles and things like that on your brush, all right? So we're just gonna check our flow. My needle is a little bit loose, so we're just gonna push the needle all the way forward, do the back up, pop it down. Okay, so we're just gonna pick a little area, checking our flow. High air pressure, okay, and then all we do is just gonna mist down a coat first. The idea of just misting down a coat first is because then you've given the uh, the surface something to grip onto, okay? If you go in and try and flood it on, it's just gonna slide off. Cut to air, dry it back, okay? As soon as you've got a layer on like that, you can literally come in and put down your primer coat, which you just wanna be quite an even coat, but you don't wanna go totally over the top, okay, make sure you always do your edges, okay, and that is it. So we just tip that one away because we're going to use the same airbrush for everything, okay, and that will give you your spray pattern just like that, and as you can see, once we dry this back, we just cut to air, just empty that, cut into air, we just dry this off, you'll see you get a very nice finish so when you're over spraying it okay and you're going in with your new color it's got a texture on there for your paint to grip to that's really what priming's doing it's just preparing the surface for the next paint what it does from our point of view also it shows you any mistakes blemishes um, you know fingerprints bad glue marks everything else on your model so when you come through okay and perhaps you're you know, we've done some quite tricky ones on the tornado down here. We've got this seam line that joins down to make sure all the rescribing has worked and it's all quite nice and it's finished nice down in these areas down in here. By primer, you can look at it. If it looked a little bit awful, perhaps if the rescribing didn't look right or something else like that, that's the point where you say, right, okay, we'll let it dry, sand it back, rescribe it, reline it, whatever you're gonna do, then come back in. But technically, from a point of view of paintwork, all this is is a way for actually the paint to stick better. Because obviously, if you were doing it straightforward onto plastic card or you know, a styrene sheet in general, you're gonna have trouble with it sticking. Now it's got a, you know, a satin or a flat finish, the paint's got texture, when it hits it, it sticks, okay? So you eliminate things like spidering, okay, and wet looks and everything else like that. So next up, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go straight into the polyurethane stuff, so I'm just gonna clean out my airbrush, we we'll just do a quick on the fly clean. Okay. Now the polyurethane stuff is different. Don't you know it's a different animal altogether. Okay, so we'll just tip that out. Sorry, we're inundated with the hoses down here. Right, so the secrets with the polyurethane one. First of all, make sure it's had a good mix, okay, because it does separate. So make sure you've given it a very good mix in your color, in your bottle there. All right, so I've got in here, as you can hear, usual thing, marine grade um, uh, stainless steel uh, bolts uh, and some nuts in there to literally knock it all about. The thing is, don't overdo it, because what happens is you will turn it almost into an emulsion. Okay, it gets very aerated. And you can keep going, it'll turn to like a mousse. All right, but literally, the great thing about this, you don't have to mix it or anything else. It goes straight into your color cut. Now this is supposed to be gray, but as you can see, it's more like white. 
Now, when you're putting this down, okay, the secret to this one is to literally put down a very faint coat first, then build up. I know a lot of you have had trouble with it because you say you can't put it down because it does, it pulls up. Because it's a, um, a polyurethane type paint, it doesn't like oils uh, and things like that. So if you've got grease, oil, release agent, things like that on the model, it's gonna come up to compensate for that. If you literally come down and you just put down, and I know we're talking white on white here, so it's not gonna be easy to see, but you just put down a very light model area. Now you might be able to see, if I can catch this in the light, there we go, where was it? You might be able to see just down here, you got that reflection, and that's where it's bubbling up. That's an oil mark, probably off of probably me eating crisps or something. Okay, and you can see it just in the light. So what you want to do is come along and just dust a little bit over there. Okay, then cut to air. And it's a shame you can't see this because I can actually see fingerprints. You can see in there, so where it's building up. Just cut to air now and dry this down. You might be able to see just catching there in the lights. We're talking this area just down here. That's a fingerprint. I can actually see my fingerprint. Okay, so what we're going to do, just cut into air, drying it back. And that is the trouble with the polyurethane stuff. It doesn't like grease or anything else. So you can obviously prepare your model. Plastic prep sheets, if you wanted to do it, you just give them a wipe over, or you could just go around it with a little air, bit of airbrush cleaner and go over. But you can see now, I hope you see it going. So what I'm doing is drying it down. Now that's got its first initial coat on there, we can actually go along and put down a heavier one. Okay, we're just gonna plug this right over. Okay, we'll just cut to air and we'll dry it back and hopefully you can see and that's it. But you need that initial footprint, okay, down on there to literally give the rest of it something to bite to. Now the trouble with this is, as we know, it takes a, a bit to dry, so I'm just gonna dry this off in sort of real time. The beautiful thing with this though, is that literally, and I'll do a bit here, if you was to go over the top, so if you come in here and literally flood, like you can see that pull mark there, catch it in the light. Right, if we leave that, it will self-level. Now, if you was to do that with something like the Tamiya or anybody else's, you're gonna have that mark will stay there. So we're just gonna dry this down. And the other thing with this stuff, once you've got a coat of it on, if you come back and give it a really wet coat, you'll get a superb finish with it. And to be honest, it fills a lot of the gaps. So the hind was a classic example. I had a few iffy joins and little marks, flood it, okay? Don't touch it, leave it, okay? Come back a couple of days later, beautiful finish. That's why I like this stuff. And I know a lot of you have said, it's God, it's awful, it's not nice and everything else. All right, so we're just drying this down artificially. Okay, but as you can see, we've still got that wet mark, but it'll go. But it is all starting to dry back now. I'm just gonna pop that to one side, get rid of this. Polyurethane stuff as well does not like sitting in your airbrush, okay? So I tend to use normal uh, acrylic thinners. Goes in, I'll give this a good mix, get it out of the color cup. And remember, don't blow this through because what happens is, especially if you're taking your time, it will dry in the actual color cup up here. You'll get a skin, that skin does not dissolve and then it will go down to your nozzle and we're back to what we were talking about last week with spitting and spattering out the end and stopping and starting, your airbrush physically stalling. Uh, that's because things like that get in there. Here's my horrible dump it area. Okay, so what I tend to do is I'll do that. Then we'll just go with another one. Okay, I'm just giving it a swirl and no point have I done the trigger or anything else. Okay, that goes down in there. Then I'll get in with a cloth. Then I'll get in with a cotton bud or your Q-chip. Just put that down there. Just get that to soak up around the needle. Okay, and as you can see, we've still got bits down on here like that. So that gets rid of those. Then we can come in, put some in, blow it through. And the whole point of blowing it through is then clearing out. But again, don't crip the nozzle and blow it back because that can cause problems. And there we go, one cleaned out airbrush, all good to go. Now, last up 
is using this stuff. Now, this is the Mr. Surfacer, which you do, it is a uh, enamel, basically. Okay, it's a cellulose-based product, so it's a completely different animal. And to be honest, we are empty in that one. Where's my other one? We've got lots of it here. That was dried out. One second. So up in here, I have my collection. So there we go. We can use a nice, clean one. So what, actually, what I can do is make some up. So as you can imagine, this stuff is pretty thick, pretty gloopy. So what I'm gonna do is I'll make myself up a new batch and that's the way I do it. This is gonna need a good mix because to be honest, it's been sat up there. I tend to buy sort of six at a time, buy a pack. Uh, so they do hang around a bit. So we'll just do that. So what we're gonna do is pop some, this is the self-leveling thinners, okay? So that will go in there. We're just gonna put a bit in there. And then what we'll do, we're just going to pop these have these nice little protective caps that get everywhere on here so that will go in then what we're going to do is around about 50 50 mix into there then what we'll do we're just going to pop the lid on that a bit messy can we get here things out of those right that one goes on then the end cap goes in there, lid goes on, and we give this a good mix. Okay, shake it up. You don't have to worry about this stuff like you do the other one if it emulsifies and all the rest of it. Okay, so what we do is give this a good mix in here. Now, if you don't mix this enough, what will happen is it literally it's like cobwebs when you airbrush it, it strings because there's, it's too thick. If that's happening, keep thinning it, okay? So we put a little bit in there. Back to our test sheet, okay? I'm covered in it now. Okay, and then what we'll do is we're just gonna come down this area here. Exactly the same thing, so a nice light dusty coat first. Okay, dry it back. Okay. And then this one, you can come in, put down quite a heavy one. Okay, just gonna pop this on. Oh, a tick, just to clear the room a bit. But if we just cut to air, Just dry this back. Now, by also by actually spraying it, you're artificially drying it a little bit quicker. The only trouble with that is you can actually get a skin effect. So I call it the eggshell because what actually happens is is that the actual surface will get like a crispy crust on it okay like an eggshell underneath it's really soft so the only drawback is if you come along now and grab this what you think you know you go oh that's dry that's dry that's dry when you hold it you'll put a fingerprint because the heat from your hand will melt that top crust and it'll sink into the softer stuff on the side and that is the trouble with all enamels at the end of the day you get that skin effect and you think oh that's good you hold it and then we've all been there your fingers get stuck to it okay so we just dry that back So what we actually have, you can see it on these, we actually have a system of them all on here. So as you said, we're all touch dry with them all, no problem at all now. Okay, so what we can do is a quick sanding test. So I've got an old sanding sponge here. We can just give them a bit of a rub. Get one in the angle. Okay, so it takes quite a bit of abuse. 
Okay, no problem there. We move to a slight body, uh, newer one. Sorry, I'm just going to be a bit newer at that end. Sharper. But as you can see, we can sand this and have no problems at all. And we can actually polish it to a very fine coat. Let's find a, one of these guys. Okay, this is one of the stronger grit ones. But as you can see, you can sand straight through. And you don't have any problem with it. It's not like it wrinkles up or anything else. But when we come over to this guy, which I know is going to be a bit difficult white and white, so I'll do it in here. You might be able to see automatically we've rolled up. And this is because it's this stuff. So you can't, and it clogs up your, your sponge. And that's purely because this stuff just rolls up. Okay, but then this one over here, bearing in mind we've only just done it, so hopefully it'll work. Okay, again. Just sands. Okay, very nice, no problem at all. So that is the problem with using this stuff, okay. But give it a few days, it will dry, and you have no problem with it. Recommendation, you can't go wrong with using Tamiya, but it's expensive, okay? That is the only drawback to it. You could use the rattle cans, but again, you do have the risk of flooding the area, and by the time you've messed around with trying to decant it and all the rest of it, it's a messy process, and let's face it, you know, when you're only saving a bit of a, like a quid or something else like that, it's really not worth it. The Mr. Surface 1200 is a great way of doing it. It's really, really nice and everything else. It's just a little bit messy. The major drawback to it is the smell, okay? Because obviously being it's lacquer based and all the rest of it, it is gonna smell a bit. Or your other option is to literally come in and just use one of the pre-bought ones like Mr. Surfacer, but you're gonna have problems with it. That's why I use different ones, in a nutshell. If it's gonna take a while, I'll use the Mr. Surfacer. If the surface isn't perfect, I'll use the, the, this one here, sorry, the um, polyurethane one. If I want a quick job, straightforward, I use the Mr. Surfacer, no problem at all. If I want an even quicker job and I just wanna chuck it on, I use the Tamiya one. So there is no real best one to use. They're all really good. It's just up to you on how you want to use them. If you say, if you wanna use them, you know, and just stick with using Mr. Surfacer, as you've seen, it's perfect, no problem at all. If you're just not too sure and you're just, gonna, you know, it's starting out, something else like that, just do a 50-50 mix with Tamiya because that's a great way of doing it and everything else times on your side then obviously you've got the polyurethane so there we go primers no easy answer to it but i hope we've covered all the bases okay so there you go that's primers there's no particular reason why i just use um you know one primer as i said it, if it's in a situation where it's not perfect and it's not brilliant i'll probably go for the polyurethane and flood it and let itself level and smooth all those imperfections out if it's a quick job and something small i'll usually as i say i'll reach for the tamiya just do a 50 50 mix blow it in and away we go if it's something that's not bad all over got a bit of time no problem i'll go with the mr surfacer route okay if it's the big stuff um now i'm talking the really big stuff i'm like the space shuttle to be honest when i did the space shuttle with the booster set and everything else it was done from rattle cans purely because it's just so much easier to do it. You can take it out, you can blast it down, and it's not gonna cost a fortune, because as I say, one of these will do tons of it. Yes, you can decant this stuff into the other one. It's just extremely messy, it stinks, and all the rest of it. And I think for the hassle that all goes into it, I really can't be bothered. It's just as easy to go out this out, hang it on a wire, spray it, uh, and away you go and do it like that. But if you're doing something like airliners, big stuff that's, you know, that hasn't got small details and all the rest of it, then I would go for this. Just remember, keep it very light mists as you're going down and build it up. Don't just do heavy passes because you're gonna flood it and you're gonna lose all your detail when you do it on a can because it's not designed for doing fine detail. That's where your airbrush comes in because the amount that it's pushing out is a lot smaller than obviously an automotive type things. But there we go, that's primers. Hopefully that's, um, helped 
the reasons why I use so many. A lot of the stuff, as you'll notice with all of mine, I do have multiples of things, and it just depends either on my mood or on a, a situation. I might think this might work slightly better in this situation, and that's why I'll switch to it. Um, other things, I'll just use that same thing. I haven't found anything better time and time again. Okay, and that's basically how I, I run through it. Okay, next up, reviews. We got some cracking reviews for this week, so we're gonna start off with the all new Kinetic FA2 Sea Harrier. Okay, kit review time. Today we've got the Kinetic. Uh, this is the 148 scale FA2 Harrier. We've been after a kit like this for a long time, and I must admit, it came as a bit of a surprise a few months back when Kinetic suddenly poked their hand up and said they're working on one. Um, obviously, Airfix did the FA2. 148 scale, that's really it. Airfix, the only ones who's really sort of tackled the kit. It was recessed panel lines, but it's a very old Airfix kit, and to be honest, it was soft. Um, it wasn't very good. It had raised details on the wings because it was taken from the FARS1, uh, which is, um, you know, Know, obviously the first generation of the Harrier. This is the bang up to date kit, new tooled and everything else like that, completely unopened. So as you can see on the front we have got some very nice box art, lovely uh, painting down here and we've got all the normal bits and pieces on here. So we've got some blurb, a few little reference shots and the usuals all the way around this one. As you can see 2014 kit okay, and everything in there. So it is a kit number uh, K48041, so if we just come in, dig it in here, we can have a look and see what we've got. So, we've got a few screws, we'll just start at our usual. So we've got a nice big decal sheet. We've got a little bit of photo etch, which is very thin and bent. Okay, so we've got quite a cheap instruction sheet to it. Looks like someone did it on a photocopier, uh, to be honest. So usual thing, we've got um, we've got the parts trees basically down here. We've got the color callouts in a nice uh, spread of colors. So we've got the humbrals, uh, we've got the GSI colors, the Italy now, which is different. Um, Tamiya, not many of those to be honest. Uh, it's even got the MIG ammo colours, although there's none of it in there, but they're in the chart. Uh, Vallejo and the Model Air. So, usual thing, if you can imagine, we're going straight in with the cockpit. You've got a, an option, looks like, on the cockpit, uh, which be interesting to see what that option is. Does that mean there's a, another version? I was only aware of one. It looks like it goes together pretty much like the 72nd ones, as in that we've got these um, back system which doubles up as a wheel well for the fan, uh, and then going through the seat going in and the bits and pieces. And so it's a bit strange, it's on an angle like this. And then uh, it looks like we do have working uh, fans. I'm not a mass fan of this. I can't imagine why anybody would want to move them around, but if you did want to do it, it looks like the actual, the nozzles themselves will all swing because they are joined up in that sort of, I think it was the 132nd Revel um, GR1 Harrier, the original one that was the Navy uh, US one as well, uh, Marine one, uh, but as you say, look a bit odd. So usual things, poking all those bits and pieces inside uh, with the air brake, obviously open and close, nice detail. Uh, the fans uh, for the actual ducting system, you can have the little uh, side vents open or close, which is pretty good. Uh, usual things going in, wings, two halves going together, top section going on, obviously positioning then. So I think we'd have it maneuvering around. Okay, then we got gear going in. As you can imagine, right the way through, usual things. The doors, I can't see any problems with any of this anywhere at all. It's saying for drilling out some of the holes, so it makes you wonder if there would be another version coming, but how they'd make another version out of this one is beyond me. Uh, going up and close, the weapons fit, Amram, Sea Eagle, Aiden Cannon and Sidewinder fit, which is the standard to the, the Harrier. And then obviously we've got uh, the bits and pieces going down there, that weapons fit going on, pretty standard. And then we've got the cockpit set, the refueling probe, canopy open or closed. 
as it goes right the way through. Okay, so which is very nice, which has been after for a while. We do have the positionable flaps, okay, which is a very nice touch to see. It's about time we've seen that. And then we've got the common markings all going down there for all the decal placements. Uh, and then for the other side and for the one so these were the decommissioning schemes um, that the actual uh, navy had so this was 800 squadrons it was always very striking with that red back it was always a nightmare putting that decal on okay and then we've got the other one as well which was the final one i remember which had the original blue right away over the top okay for our 899 squadron and everything else okay and then just down here, you've got the normal uh, markings for the low vis if you want to do it for 801 and 800 as well. But as I said, this is all the uh, uh, decommissioning schemes that the actual aircraft have. But it's quite nice because you've got all the information about the uh, last cruise, the detachment, 2005, uh, onto Illustrious as well, which is quite a nice touch. And we've got the Yeovilton uh, March ones and the Disband ones of 2006. I know this quite well because I used to live just down the road from this and I used to spend many a happy afternoon uh, at the end of runway 27 at Yorkton in a farmer's field having Harry's hovering right over your head, nothing better. Okay, so if we have a look at the decal sheet, as you can see, um, this does need to be a very thick, big decal because it, it needs to conform over the back of a Harrier very complex curve to it so if it's not thick it would tear and everything else and it looks actually very thick but you're going to need that to be honest but the rest of them beautifully printed it's absolutely gloss like all over it which is really really nice to be honest they all look really thick but i think you'll get away with it um, minimal carrier film on it all as well so very nicely printed but to be honest it's cartograph decal so you sort of expect that but it does look very very nice clean crisp all the way through as you can see um, plenty of different bits and pieces going on here for the different markings and everything else and obviously we've got all the stencil data but again really nice we've got all the numbers down here so you can make up any particular aircraft you want out of any of these schemes which is a very nice touch basically any of the Harrier fleet that were around in 2005 2007 time you can make one from it which is a very nice touch okay so a tiny little bit of photo etch which is extremely thin because it's bent already uh, these have got the fences for the wings it looks like um, I'm not sure what the other little bits are uh, a little bit of PE down there but you can see quite nicely done although I almost lost it a little tuck them inside there okay so first bag up we have these are sticky bags so we can seal these I say we've been waiting for a decent Harrier for a while. It'd be nice if they redid the entire uh, 48th scale. So first for impressions, it's a very nice, strong styrene, extremely hard, crispy. It's not the soft type, which is lovely to see. Looking at it, uh, the detail, little bit soft. It's a tiny little bit soft with the actual uh, rescribing, but I think it's good enough. Certainly it's got that effect where the riveting seems to be pretty much in scale. Everything in, let's say it's just a little bit shallow and then other things Things, perhaps like around this tail back here is a little bit harder if I just drop this camera in just a little bit you can probably see catch it in the light see it's quite hard as you can see because of the, the system we have here to show it but you can see that we've got some bigger markings here on the tail and everything else but generally from what I remember of Harry's and say unfortunately haven't been around them for a while uh, it looks pretty good nicely done it's a little bit soft down here on the bottom edge where the molds wrapping around as we've said before and I'm wondering it, I spoke about when we was doing the thing about I'm wondering if uh, you could backdate it or something well they've actually got a cut mark inside the fuselage here now this is the band the section which all the uh, original uh, FRS 1 Harriers went off and were sort of you know upgraded and updated and because of that they had this band which I think was around about sort of um, I think it's around about four foot uh, section put in which lengthened the fuselage and everything else for it but I don't know. I don't know if you would chop that out, it would just make it join because obviously everything would be slightly different. But it does make you wonder why it is completely cut all the way in there if they're going to try and release another version. But obviously the nose is different, so I can't understand how they would make that work because just taking that out doesn't make an FRS1. Um, you'd have to do the nose as well, and I can't see a cut point on the nose unless they're going to come up with some clever, ingenious way. 
On the inside, as you can see, we've got some locating areas, some various things like that. Ejector pins are pretty much level. You've got one here. You're gonna to have to sand that one out because otherwise it's gonna interfere with the other one, but pretty standard stuff. But generally all over it, the riveting detail seems to be pretty good. It does fade off in these middle sections, but generally, you know, it's all pretty much there. Can't complain about it. It does look nice. And it is nice, it's that hard styrene instead of the soft one. Okay, so, in bag two. Okay, we'll do the big one first. So this is the wing, top of the wing. And if we catch it in the light, you can see we've got quite nice detail. Pretty much spot on. It's a nice smooth, uh, pretty uh, riveting. It looks like it's got the correct top on it as well. Uh, working its way around the ring. These vortex generators, they're quite thin. I think they'll work. They are, I would say, at the wrong angle. It looks like they're actually perfectly with the angle where I always thought they were slightly offset to generate more uh, sort of vortexes. The idea behind these is that literally it creates more uh, sort of rough air for the control surfaces to work better. Uh, so by generating more rough air over the top of the wing, it generates more lift and things like that. So, pretty good on all of that. I'm having quite a good look and finding quite hard to come up with things. It's a little bit flashy around it, but no problems at all. Down on the inside, no problem. I'm guessing the old uh, puffer jets, because um, obviously we've got this one down here and in there, they would be nicer to have them detailed a little bit more, but I think we'd get away with that. This is little holes in here and that go with these uh, obviously for controlling the aircraft uh, and its roll when it's in the hover. I've got a little tiny ejector pin mark which is down in the middle of these which would have been nicer to see that uh, not particularly there but generally pretty good all over the rest of that. Uh, obviously details, this is the nose wheel detail for this guy down here but generally as you can see we've got some nice riveting detail and everything else going over uh, with these tail planes, so that's pretty good. And then we've got no problem with these intakes, they look to be nice and smooth. It's a two part system, so we've got an inside, so that's quite nice with the actual internal. So we've got no ejector pin marks in there. The actual little doors running in, they're pretty good. As I say, instrument panels you can either have uh, the twin one or the single. Now I'm going to have to do my homework here, but I always imagine there wasn't a twin one on the FA2. I thought it just had the single. Um, but uh, So I don't know why it's saying about a different choice in that, but as I say, I am out of the loop of it. Cockpit detail, not bad. Okay, pretty good. Nice detail for the rear. Uh, actually, that's pretty nice down in there as well. So I think get away with that. The fan could have been a little bit nicer. It would have been nice to have that as a separate one because that way you could actually do the fan in like a metallic and then the back wall a different color to make it stand out a little bit more. But I think that's pretty good. Okay, so down in here, we have, let me do this guy first. So, this is the, I think it's the speed, uh, the main well for the gear, for the main gear, because there isn't actually a main well, I don't think. They've just done it in the closed position, which is fair enough. All the doors, the control surfaces. Got a slight little bit of flash going on on the control surfaces. Got the refueling probe, obviously quite nicely done. And then there's those parts all there. And then obviously all the little bits, as you can see, no real problem with any flash or any sort of little bits and pieces hanging over. That's quite nice. This is the control system for that nozzle, which I probably wouldn't bother with. Um, outer riggers for the actual gear, not bad. Again, it's not uh, any flat wheels or anything else like that, or weight on wheels, I should say. So unfortunately not. The main gear, <laughs> itself it seems to be pretty good. I must admit I'm finding it very hard to find a fault with this. Um, you know it's a little bit soft in some areas, would have been nice to see it sharper but pretty good nevertheless. Pylons themselves as you can see very nicely done. We've got the Aiden cannons up here and the nose. Now the nose is the only thing I can see as a bit of a weak thing because I don't know how well the camera can actually pick up this nose, but I just don't know. It doesn't look the right shape. I don't know why, it just has that needle in the back of my neck. Okay, so we've got, these are one piece cast um, nozzles, which is quite nice, so you don't have two halves to go together. 
it's a shame they're not hollow. <laughs> Uh, you could probably do something with that by just cutting out the back perhaps a little bit and then you could have them as a hollow right the way in and everything else like that. Speed brake, some nice details in there. Main canopy, pretty good. Horrible split wheels and things like that, we don't like that. Okay. Right, looks like we've got a mirrored pair, which makes sense. <clears throat> so we've actually got here, uh, we've got the fuel tanks looking pretty good. So we've got some nice riveting detail and things like that going on with those. That's quite nice. Moving down to here, so we've got the side winders. Uh, we've got the, the actual uh, sway braces, things like that for the missiles. We've got smaller fuel tanks, okay. Weapon rails as we're going right the way through. A uh, little air scoop there, which is for the Sea Eagle, I do believe. Um, and then obviously the Sea Eagle missile itself. Quite a nice touch. Amram missiles. So not too bad at all, though. Okay, so we have clear part. Actually, that looks quite nice. A little bit of flash on this guy. Uh, you probably see it on the edge here. Uh, but I wouldn't actually get worry about that because the rest of it is pretty nice. The he might be able to get away with a wash to do the deck cord on the top of this, um, and that, so that hasn't too bad at all. But generally, that's very nice, clear. You see, there isn't much wobble going on down there, considering its complex shape. Got the windscreen wiper molded in. Sometimes that's nicer to have as a loose fit, and then you can put it on afterwards once you paint it up. But generally, quite nice. And then obviously we've got all the lights and the various things for it. I actually have to say, um, you know, not wanting to kick the kit or anything else, but apart from the node, which I think looks wrong, but it's just that niggling thing in the back of my head that just says that doesn't look right. Actually, I have to say that looks like a cracking kit. It's, it's everything we wanted in a Harrier, especially the FA2, because I think that sort of gets overlooked a little bit. Um, but as a Harrier fan and knowing the aircraft quite well, uh, it certainly seems to tick all my boxes. A few little things like why has it got the split for the uh, real fuselage? Uh, you know, I can't imagine a conversion coming along. It'd just be easier just to do a new fuselage uh, and go for it like that. But certainly it's got everything I'll be looking for in a Harrier. It's recessed and detail, which is lovely. It's got obviously positionable flaps up and down, which is great because you can have it in the downward position, which is a first for the Harrier off the bat. Uh, and then obviously you've got all the little bits and pieces uh, to really detail it up and to turn it into a fantastic model. So there you go. If you are in the mood for an FA2, and let's face it, I can't see why you wouldn't be, this is definitely the kit to get. The thing I love about this kit, um, in hindsight as you look back, is the way it actually goes together. It's quite nice that it's just a two-piece fuselage instead of a sort of a three-piece, because then it gets complicated and everything else. I'm thinking like the Hasegawa ones uh, and things like that. But certainly, I, you know, this band system, which you can even see it in the, the pack, in the artwork on the box, they've actually put that band in. There's a cut in there. I don't know how they're actually going to work that into being different versions and it's a shame it doesn't isn't more modular if it had like you know a brake perhaps on the nose for putting in the earlier harrier cockpit for perhaps uh the frs1 version it would be quite nice to do that one as well but i'm hoping fingers crossed they come along and do a new range of 148s in the british one the american ones are really well covered by the hasagawa range um you can do all of those um and obviously they've done the gr7 but the early ones i'm thinking like you know as you say the, the sort of gr1 and GR3 Harriers, nice new tool would be absolutely lovely. But kudos to them. I have to say, looking at it without building it yet, it does look like probably Kinetic's best kit to date. Very nicely engineered and everything else, and really I can't find a fault with it. Okay, next up, something, as I said, I've been speaking about this kit for a while. Um, I ordered it when it first came out purely because, it, say, something different, something I want to build, and this is the Tamiya 135th scale Mark IV World War I tank. Okay, so we've got here is the Tamiya 135th scale. This is the Mark IV male uh, British tank, which obviously you probably know is World War I and the first tanks out, hence being Mark IV. Now, uh, recent news shows, I did mention how there was a definitely a lack of World War I armor, especially when we were coming up for the anniversary, obviously, World War I. 
to be honest, I didn't realize Tamiya was quite that far advanced with their one. Uh, and obviously we got down here is Tacom have done them as well. So this, they've got actually the male and female versions of it. This is just the male at the version uh, from Tamiya's uh, stable. This one though comes with a motor, so it's actually drivable, okay? And this is the export version, which comes with a set of figures, which is Tamiya's new set, which you can buy as a standalone as well, okay? Which is something we'll cover uh, later on. Certainly, as I said, I've been wanting to do a World War Tank 1 tank for a while. Very limited on what there is. Yes, there is obviously good markets out there, but not so much in 135th scale. So anyway, here we go. We've got very nice box art, as you can imagine, going right the way through. As I said, this is the export version, which comes with their five-figure set, uh, which is quite nice. It has the motor, little bits down there. There's a couple of um, deck options for this particular one. As you can see, it's pretty much down here. So usual bits and pieces. Obviously showing the other one there as well. And it says it runs on one AA battery and it's got the figure set in there as well. Uh, the kit number for this one is, doo -doo -doo, where's the kit number gone? Uh, kit number is uh, item number 3057-6900. As I said, export version comes with the figure sets. I don't know other ones. This one I bought, uh, I had it on pre-order with Lucky Model in Japan, uh, um, Japan, Hong Kong. Uh, so that was it. So export version, I don't know quite what they mean by that. It could be all the ones that aren't in perhaps Japan won't will have the figures and won't. So not sure how that's actually gonna work. Anyway, in the box we have the said figures, which we'll look at in a moment. Okay, and as you can see, it's a pretty stuffed box with all this stuff down here. We've got a little bit of notice about the, I presume this is the drive sprocket for it, how that goes together. Here we've got quite a weighty bag of all the bits here, as you can see. So we've got some pretty mechanical looking stuff in here, Allen keys, there's our motor and everything else and our switch unit. You know, I know there's people and they've said about why put a motor in it, it's rubbish and all the rest of it. It's just a little bit of fun, why not? If it's in there, build it, you know, you paid for it. Uh, I'm assuming this is more drive wheel stuff, which is probably what that paper notice was about, because it looks like it's very similar to that one down in there. Link sets, uh, obviously we'll go through those in a moment. And then this is, I think goes along with the other one, Sprue Y. We'll have to check on that one goes out. And as you can see, it's a pretty stuffed box here. It's quite a lot of bits and pieces going on down in here. And then we have our instructions. Okay. So we've got some decals we'll look at the moment. This is for the figures. As I say, it's all a bit odd, all of this one, because we've got some various things in here. So we've got a sheet on background information talking all about the actual uh, vehicle itself. Okay, and we've got the pullout uh, with all the markings, as you can see right the way across there. And we've got some nice uh, detailed shots of the real thing. So we've got a few little reference shots down in there. i put them on the close up, you can see this is the male. Now the difference between the male and the female, if you're wondering, is the male has the gun, the cannons. Okay, the female has the machine gun. And they do the hermaphrodite one, which has got both. It's got machine guns and cannons on there. Um, so that is your general difference between it. But generally, the male ones just had the um, six pounder guns on the outward ones. They all had the uh, machine guns on the front, but it's just the way it was actually fitted out. Uh, looking at them. Okay, but as you said, some nice little background information about it there, talking about all the various parts on there uh, as you go through. So there we go, talks about it, got the exhaust coming over the top, the six pounder gun, uh, and then we got we got the uh, Lewis uh, 7.62 machine gun on the front and everything else like that. Uh, and that's the unditching beam, if you ever wonder what that bit of wood over the top, you can throw it over the front and then pull itself around. That's generally how it works. Okay, so, quite a nice little extra bit of information. The instructions themselves, uh, it's probably gonna be a little bit odd because we're gonna be talking about the mechanical side of things and that's what it's talking about here for putting it through the distances you need to do. You've actually got to build the battery compartment and put the actual terminals in and things like that and then we're off. So putting into the motor, which is obviously a one piece drop in and then putting the other areas in. 
If you didn't want to do it with the motor, I think you're still gonna need the motor at the back because it's gonna position the rear stuff, but you just don't have to put everything else in if you didn't want to. But why wouldn't you want to? It runs, it's brilliant. Going right the way through, it comes together quite quickly, uh, to be honest from what I've seen. Uh, the various parts all going in there. Okay, putting in the top uh, over the top, some more little parts going in. It's going to use the polycap system because the way that the battery fits, uh, you take off the sort of side pod to get to the battery. Uh, the on-off switch is underneath. Okay, so there we go, some more bits and pieces going in there and then putting in all the little road wheels for the tracks to run on. Talking about holding them into place with tape, which is a nice thing because the side bits lock it all down and in. So when the side plates go on, it holds all those little road wheels in position. Okay, some more things, talking about the road wheels on the other side, doing the same for the other one, more sprockets going in, then putting in the drives, uh, the Lewis machine guns up at the front uh, and around the rear. Okay, talking about the guns, so you've actually got the uh, six pounder gun system going in and the details for those going right the way in. Again, it's using poly counts because they're maneuverable uh, and those types, that's very nice. Okay. The actual entire thing goes in on the side and then plugs in because your battery is in there and that's how you access the battery so you don't glue it. Okay, exhaust system going in over the top. The track, which is something we'll cover. Um, as I said, I am going to be doing this as a build. It's going to be coming up as one of my sort of more speedy builds we're doing uh, and everything else. But certainly this is the, apparently one of the best track systems there is out there because it is self-locking, snapped together, okay? So there's no glue, there's no pins, and it works extremely well. From everybody I've spoken to who's built this, and I know quite a few people have done it now, they've said it's brilliant. Where normally it, it's boring, to help to put these things together this one goes together a dream and it works and it holds itself all the little details going in so we've got the rail system for the top for the unbreaching bar uh, and there we go the cable goes into the rear and then obviously we're talking about that um, sorry the unditching bar going over the top the switch goes in the bottom uh, caution sticker why would you put that on there that does <laughs> I don't know quite why you do that um, you're probably not going to want to put that sticker on there. Caution rotating parts in big letters. I'm assuming it's because, obviously, um, what have we done with it? Yes, it's these ones here. Um, I'm assuming these have had to be put on for some type of legal reason uh, from Tamiya, so you're not ever gonna use these, but if you did want to put them on, perhaps you've got schools, things like that, then you can do it. It's basically saying caution rotating parts is hot uh, and the on off thing for it. Probably wouldn't be using those for everyone else. Parts call out and we're back to the front, okay? So there we go, very nice. Let's have a look at the kit. So we'll start with the big bits. Start in here, so staple together in one bag. Hey, look, past the parcel, and in bag two. Okay, so in here, this is obviously the side ones, and what we're looking at is obviously the detail, as you can see, is beautifully done. Okay, for all of this stuff. So this is where your road wheels, this is obviously the outer looking in. Um, and it looks absolutely fantastic. It's probably the better way up for it as it shows how it would go along, something like this. Okay, down in there, quite a nice thing. The unditching bar, you can see at the back, so it's got the bolts running through it. It's not much to it like that. A couple of little things, okay. And again, on the inside, this is where all your road wheels are gonna click into or slide onto, I should say. Okay, and everything else. And you've got the cogs and the various bits for the rear, it's just a mirror as that goes over. So, pretty straightforward. And some more of the detail on this side. So, again, we're looking down onto these, and it goes that way. Okay, as you can see, not tons of detail. Obviously, this is the insides of them, which is nothing. But when you get to the outside, as you can see, actually very nice detail on these. The bolt system, I think that'll take a wash. It's very nice, very sharp. Probably what we expect of um, Tamiya anyway. But generally, that's really nice stuff all over that. And on the other side, as you can see, and then down on these, as you can see, that bolting is all really, really nice system on that one. And obviously these are gonna be able to your poly caps in there for actually doing the system so it can actually hold that side pod on for the battery. Okay. 
Okay, so these are the side uh, areas. So these guys would fit in and go right the way around. Again, it's this all this bolting detail, as you can see it all over here, is extremely crisp. At no angle is it soft at all. So it doesn't sort of fade off on corners and everything else. And you've got nice joins in here with this plating that goes in and where it's bolted in and everything else like that. So that's really nice, as you can see all the way down here absolutely fantastic and into the middle one and i do have to say if you have never been and obviously and you're in the uk to the bobbington tank museum which is a members meet we went there last month two months ago now uh, when we had the members weekend and everything else if you haven't been you've got to go okay it, because you can see this very tank there you've got all the marks of british tank all the way through um and everybody else's so to speak and when you're up close to these things absolutely amazing and obviously you've got them set into dioramas giant ones um and uh, it really gives you a great scale effect to these things and you understand how big they are and considering how cumbersome they were and what they did and obviously you can get inside them see for your references and everything else like that there we go that is obviously quite a large sprue here going through some of the details again no soft molds no flash mind you you wouldn't expect any of that but generally you know we've got the entrance hatch down there and the vents looking very very nice all of this stuff this hole here is obviously for the on off switch which will be on the bottom okay and then just into the smaller parts beautifully nice and crisp and last up we have it's got a duplicate sprue so we just look at the one uh, as you can see pretty nice stuff this is all the wheels uh, as you can imagine going right the way through and we've got the drive sprockets and all the areas as it goes down and obviously that's the gun for the gun areas and these are the shields uh, for them and they obviously the gun mounts down here very very nice so just last of all we just want to have a play with this this is their track link system and i say i've never touched this before it's the first time i've even opened the box so we just get a few of these out just to see how well they work okay so you've got a system you've got very nice detail okay you've got a small little snip mark on these you can probably see them on all pretty well it goes and then what you've actually got is this hook system as it's all going to go together so basically you click one over one side okay and then you come in and it just it's no effort actually i thought you're going to have to really pull it on okay but again slide one side on and it clicks slide one side on and it clicks and then if you do the other you just do a handful of that and it clicks that is brilliant and really really easy and as you can see that will give you a really nice effect but to be honest that's one of those where it'll probably only take you 10 minutes you click them all together and you're good to go instead of the farting around what you do with some of them so even i'll be happy to build that one so there we go the track system is definitely a winner this motorized set as i say we just have a, a quick look in here and don't forget you have paid for this so you might as well do it so we've got the drive bar we've got the motor unit itself which is obviously very heavily geared so it just trundles along at the sort of correct speed we've got a tube of grease there which also you're gonna have to grease everything up before you do it we've got a little screwdriver we've got the battery tray nuts and bolts the string and the poly cap and we've got some chain in there as well okay we've got the drive metal sprockets and we've got the shims i presume they are quite a nice touch and then we've got the contacts and the velcro and everything else for holding all the bits in there so that's a very nice touch and then as i said we've got more gearing sets and everything in there so like that okay so last up we have the crew figures okay it's in a light so this is basically you get this set free in amongst it okay so actually what you're getting is i remember it's five i think it is isn't it i think it's five figures so yeah in this one here you get the officer standing the rifleman uh running kneeling okay obviously uh, half and half you've got the machine gunner lying down uh, and obviously you get a little bit of gear around them as well and obviously you've got your color call outs and the various things on there okay so in the bag again you know 
This kit, I can't remember exactly how much it was now. I've had it on pre-order so long, I can't remember what it was now. Uh, I think it's around about the sort of £50 mark, but you do get, you know, obviously the motor, it can't be cheap and all the rest of it, and you get the figure set. So if you do want to do a diorama and things like that, you've certainly got the option for it. So, as you can see, if we start on an area, we've got the legs, the various, we've got the torsos, very nicely detailed, more legs, obviously different positions, more torsos, looking at the faces, quite a nice face system there and everything else and then down here we've got helmets bags so we've got the uh, got the Lewis machine gun down there we've got the actual uh, the helmets and the baggage and all the bits and pieces and we've got the rifles bayoneted and not okay and this one this one just the same yeah, it's just the same, it's just a mirror. Okay, so I just want to see what the difference is between what you get in here and here. Yeah, so that's the difference. Starter for 10, obviously, different colour, plastic. So the one comes from the kit is light grey, the standalone is just normal. And then we've got the bits there. Uh, you don't get instructions with it or anything else like that, so, but obviously you don't really need them because you can see how they go together on the back, just like that. So there we go, that is it. World War One, absolutely fantastic with its getting the recognition it deserves. It's certainly been overlooked over the years, by myself included. I am just as guilty as everybody else. Okay, but after building the Wingnut Wings kit, uh, and hopefully I'm going to be building this one very, very soon, it should sort of, you know, pick up the old interest again. We will have next week, we've got, these are the take -on kits, which, you know, we've done, we've done reviews on them recently, um, but obviously, you know, if you're watching this later date, have a look for the take -on one, because we've got the Mark IV, which is the same tank as a male and a female version. But as I said, I'm gonna be reviewing both of these next week. So there we go, um, so this is the figure set you get with it, so you don't need to do that one if you've got the export version. I'm saying I'm still unclear about who is export version, does that mean just anything outside Japan is going to get it? Um, as I said, it, you know, check to see what you do before you rush out and buy the figure set for it as well. But it'd be quite nice to have these around in a small little diorama, perhaps around the actual uh, the tank itself and everything else like that be interesting because as i said in here next week we've got the reviews for the take -home kits um, which is the same thing technically just not motorized but you see the kit uh, is a lot bigger the box is more there's more plastic in it, everything else i don't know where it's going to go it could all just be screwed for all i know um, but certainly it'll be interesting to put the two against each other to see the differences but i like the touch it's motorized i think it's a great um tool especially with kids you know the whole point of this hobby is to get the younger generation involved and to get them sort of excited about something which can be, let's face it, pretty boring. Um, and to get them that sort of spark like we had as kids, turning this thing on and let it trundle across the floor, brilliant. That'll get any kid's excitement going, you know? So hopefully it'll sort of just, it sort of brings them a little spark, a bit of interest, a little bit of what are you doing, you know, and how do you do it? Uh, and we'll get the younger generation involved in modeling but kudos to them i like the idea of it it's nice that you get the figure set as well i think i said in the review it's about 50 quid it's not it's around about 35 um if you get it from certain places in the far east as i say this one um came out of uh uh hong kong so i think i paid 35 quid for it and then obviously you got your delivery on top but i think it's a really nice kit I am going to build it, it's going to be one of the speed builds which I'm going to do alongside the other stuff coming through purely because I want to do a little bit of armour. I've never built a World War One tank before so it's just that little bit of weathering and playing and all the rest of it that's going to go with it and I'm even going to do a little diorama for it as well so hopefully it will make it to be a nice interesting video build for you guys. So there we go, that's those, lovely job. Right, we do have to mention, and I know it's a little bit late, um, we've actually got the prize draw for last month. Um, so that it goes to, was number, um, it was the random number generator, you've all seen me use it before, did it earlier, it came out at number 216, which is Mark Johnson from Scotland, which are currently is still part of the UK. No, I'm not even going down that route. Okay, but yeah, congratulations to you, Mark. Obviously, you'll get the free year subscription. I'll sort that out for you. And I think, is it Sanders this month? I think it's Sanders you get this month and everything else. I'll reset the prize draw today. It will probably be done by the time you see this and go through. I did forget, if I'm honest. So um, yeah, sorry about that. 
so much going on you never remember it and everything else like that a um, couple of questions that have popped up uh, Telford this year yes again we've got a huge stand there uh, bigger and better than ever before we are going to be asking members to bring on their models as we normally do and everything else and then obviously the guys can babysit your models for you uh, as we go through and as I said we're, the usual team's all going to be there so no problem with that um, other thing that everyone's asking about is some of the builds um, am I going to be doing a poll for the builds coming up to be honest not for the moment because as I said we've got the HE111 coming up very shortly which I'll probably start next week because the hind will be out of the way and then we've got the big typhoon after that I'm going to hopefully be able to rattle through these a lot quicker than I've been doing recently. I've freed up a little bit of time with myself and everything else. So hopefully we can push through a little bit more. So we've got some more great builds coming your way. That's about it for this week. Back on full. Another mammoth show and everything else. As I said, stay tuned next week. Um, guys in the forum, you're going to see lots about it. I will put it on the main site as well uh, when we're going live and everything else. But as I said, for our time, it's going to be around about half past seven to half past nine something else like that so we're going to do a couple of hours a night and then do chat and everything else but it's going to be really loose and informal so if you want to build along with me get yourself some drink out get yourself a beer uh, sit down at your modeling bench and we're going to spend a couple of hours all together and uh, we can have a right laugh because it is going to be a fun build with lots of laughs and all the rest of it as we work our way through so until next monday night where i'll be here live uh, around about 7 30 until then take care and happy modeling